Thank you, Kappa Delta, for sponsoring this and for all the other uh, fraternities, sororities, organizations that are represented, ETSU Athletics, ROTC, and so on and so forth. We got a number of people here. Then I think that's pretty amazing because obviously it's voluntary. You must be here primarily because you want to gain something, hopefully a skill set that you may already have some of, but you might want to augment, or if you're like me, you don't really have any of it. When I started, I really struggled with school. Uh, I'm going to go over this, try to keep it within the hour. That's going to be uh, a task for me because I'm long-winded, uh, but I'll do my best. It's being recorded. Uh, Dr. David Curry is doing that for us and he and his staff are going to edit it so we can put it up on YouTube and make it more broadly available to people as they need it. However, the research in my class at least shows that it's the people who actually show up to get the benefit out of it. The whole thing is about really how to focus and how to maximize your memory and attention. And if you just watch it on a video and you don't already have those skill sets, you might not make it all the way through the video. In fact, there's a current version, nine parts. It's got like 1,200 views on part one and 400 views on part nine. So people don't even make it all the way through. So hopefully I'll be able to engage your attention and keep you looking upward. And you'll find out that if you fade out, that's normal. But there's some things you can do to change that. How to study, lessons learned from 11 years of being a university student, so I was where you are now. I just give a little bit of a background as to why I care to do this. I get paid nothing to do this. I do it because there's a sense of personal mission I have that I wish I had known these things when I started. And now that I do know them, I should provide them to people like myself who could use them early on in their careers. And hopefully by doing so, they might actually go beyond the bachelor's degree and get higher degrees, different kinds of professional opportunities and avenues open up to them. Because it turns out your GPA is a big deal in the professional world. Doesn't denote people who are better than other people, but it gives you opportunities or it closes doors depending on where it's at. So, 11 years, I didn't start community college until my early mid-twenties, hated high school, ran screaming from it. I graduated, but only because my mom said if I dropped out, she kicked me out of the house, and for some reason I thought she'd be serious about that. And I was working at a car wash, and I realized you can't actually pay bills with car wash money. So I had to stay around, and I did, and I graduated, barely graduated, and then I got a friend who was a roommate and we moved out together and from then on I started doing whatever I could. I started out doing floors, laying floors for Mark Lancaster who was a master of the trade. And eventually I got sick of that and I started doing carpentry for a variety of people like John Troll and Dean Stogna and other people who were masters of the trade. And I also worked with Delton Reddick doing sheetrock so that I became proficient at three major areas of construction, enough to make a decent living at, but I was never a master at any of those trades. I didn't have a passion for them. When you see what a person who's a real tradesperson can do, you see that they are an artisan. I didn't have a desire to become an artisan. That's a hard way to earn a living, too. And so I just barely stayed in work, fighting, struggling, thought I might be a musician, I certainly carried a lot of equipment, but then I didn't really write music that anybody was interested in listening to, certainly not buying. Me and my cohort, we enjoyed making it, but it wasn't commercially viable, so to speak. And eventually, being just sick of construction, <clears throat> but having a great respect for those people who actually make their living in it because it's difficult, I, I just kind of out of desperation wound up at community college, Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I didn't have a plan. All I had as a plan was I don't want to do construction for the rest of my life, and that's it. But I was older than most students at that time. I was almost 24 when I started. And I had a vision for myself that if I was going to do this thing, this school thing, I was going to do it well. If I'm going to spend time and money, I'm going to get A's. And then I found out that I actually liked it. It was kind of cool. I got to read about all manner of things, and then people would ask me, pretty much what I thought about it. 
But then they would ask it in very specific ways on tests, and that wasn't always easy to do. I had a lot of thoughts about it, but then they wanted really specific information to come back to them to demonstrate my learning. <clears throat> and I did well. I also worked really, really hard in general. So I had gotten married and I adopted a child and soon after had another child. At the same time, I worked 20 to 30 hours a week at a job in addition to going to school overtime. I usually took at least 15 semester hours. At my peak, I took 24 semester hours while working 20 to 30 hours a week and raising children. And where do you do that? I'm not manic. I'm not hypomanic. You go to work, you go to school, you do that all day, you come home, you play with the kids, you feed the kids, you put the kids to bed, now who's gonna, where, when's the homework gonna get done? Tonight. It's gonna happen at probably 11 o'clock till whenever o'clock that it gets done. <clears throat> and all too frequently that went almost all night and sometimes it went all night, two nights in a row. It's hard to do it. I had to put brute force into that to get those grades I wanted. And I would get decent grades. Low 90s usually, 92, 93. And it was interesting because you know how people talk after class, after a test especially, they, uh, they go, well, what'd you get on the test? And I'll say, oh, I got like 93. What'd you get? And they'll be like, oh, I got an 85. How'd you get a 93? Because I didn't look the same then as I look now. I wear a certain attire to project a certain kind of image. I did not have such concerns then. And they would make stereotypical judgments like, how the hell did he do it? And I say, well, I studied. And they go, well, I studied. And I say, well, how much did you study? And they would frequently reply something like, well, three hours, man. I spent three hours last night studying. I usually leave it at that. Unless they came back with, why? How long did you study? And I would say, 15 hours. And that was no joke. And I would say, I spent two hours this morning. I spent five hours last night. I spent four hours. I would total it up because I knew when I studied. I was also at every single class and I took notes the whole time and I read everything assigned to me. That is not easy to accomplish. And I got a 93 and you got an 85. Look what all I had to do to get eight points more than you. So you should be happy and proud for your 85. I had to work my ass off to get my 93. And I didn't really know what that was going to do for me in the end, but ultimately it started paying me back because the reason I had my 24 semester hour semester was that when I was a senior, I changed majors. I actually added a major because I was almost ready to graduate with a bachelor's degree in philosophy. I was so close that I just went ahead and finished that degree, but I kind of realized that you can't do a whole lot with just a bachelor's degree, and I didn't know that doctoral level training was even possible for me. It seemed like I, I, an impossibility, so I didn't even plan for it, but I thought, well, maybe I can do this psychology thing. That's fascinating, too. Maybe I can help people for a living and make, you know, mid-20s, and somebody would give me benefits like health insurance and, and retirement accounts, stuff you don't often find in construction. That would be fulfilling and solid, steady work. And somewhere in that point at the senior year, somebody said, man, your GPA, you can go to grad school. My parents have professional degrees. My mom was an RM, my dad's got an MBA. I didn't know, so, so much did I reject that upbringing, I didn't even know what that stuff meant. I mean, I knew a registered nurse had to get a degree of some kind, but I didn't know what the training was. I didn't know what an MBA was. I knew what a CPA was. <laughs> That's where he started, certified public accountant. But beyond that, I didn't get it. And I was like, well, why would I want to go to grad school? And people say, basically, more money and more freedom. I said, I like that. It's a good idea. So I figured out how to do it. Or so I thought I would figure out how to do it. First time I took a shot at it, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't get in. Despite having a 3925 GPA, two bachelor's degrees, a bachelor of arts and a bachelor of science, and an AA degree from my community college. Didn't get into grad school. Went working for $8 an hour at a mental health setting with three degrees, but doing something I really loved. I was digging working there, and I was working with master's degree therapists, and they're like, man, that's what you did to get, oh, you can't do that to fly for grad school. And they schooled me on how to make a strategy to get into grad school. So I actually do another talk on how to get into grad school, and y'all are all welcome to that as well, because I had to learn the hard way. But when I made my applications, ultimately I got my clinical master's degree, at Appalachian State University, when I was making an application there, it had a little box, would you like to be considered for scholarships and fellowships? And I thought, well, who wouldn't want to be considered? Check. 
I never thought anything would come of it, though. I just checked the box. But when I got there, I found I had won the alumni fellowship. And they paid for all my school tuition. And then I got a scholarship in the department. And that paid for all my books. I actually made $400 one semester to go to school. I profited 400 bucks and I bought a drum set because I always wanted one. <laughs> it's still in my basement. But I didn't know that that hard work early on would pay off that way later. And I made a 4-0 in my master's program and I got into Virginia Tech and I got my doctorate and, and the rest is history. Now I get to do something for a living that I absolutely love. If I was a billionaire, if I was Bill Gates money kind of person, I'd still do this for free. Because it's an amazing opportunity for me to be able to share what I learned, what I got, and give back. And that's a privilege that you get only through the training that's available to you in education and of a higher nature, and particularly graduate education. And that's why you want to do this well. It isn't that it makes you a better person, because it doesn't. There are a lot of people with PhDs, EdDs, MDs, all the Ds that aren't great people necessarily. There are a lot that are. But it doesn't make them a good person. But what it does is it opens doors. And the only way you're going to get there is by getting the GPA you need at the undergrad level so you qualify to even apply for the grad program. And you may not go, oh, I'm going to grad school. But you never know. You never know what you want to do 20 years from now. And if you do it right now, it'll be an opportunity that you can avail yourself of if you want to, but you don't have to. And that's why you need to do this thing good. And so it takes some skills. And that's why I take the time to teach people the skills because I had to work so hard that I didn't sleep very much and I didn't get to hang out with my kids as much as I wanted to. To get those grades required lots of effort. Then I got 11 years of experience under my belt. I got some good strategies by the end of it all. If I had known at the beginning what I now know, it would have been amazing, but I didn't. So I'm gonna give it to you. We're going to talk about what to do pre-class, pre-view, prepare. We're going to talk about the book itself, how to condense the book, how to make the book your friend, in class, notes and location, post-class, reviewing things that you learn in class, distributed and masked practice, which is study, time management, so you know when and how you're going to accomplish all of this, Pre-test, well, all of this is pre-test, but pre-test here, I mean the moment before the test, 30 minutes before the test, 10 minutes before the test, during the test, and after the test, post-test. We're going to go over section by section. If you have questions at any point, please feel free to ask them. I'll be happy to stop and address your questions. Pre-class, preview, prepare, and the book. See if I can get this all on one. There we go. You should read the materials before you get to class. Most people just go to class to see what they ought to have read. But usually there's a hint about what you ought to read. You've got a syllabus, right? You've got D2L now. You've got a chapter, a book. It's going to guide you into what you ought to expose yourself to prior to coming to class. Assigned readings, chapters being covered, notes provided on websites. When I went to school at the undergrad level, there were no websites. There was no D2L, no Blackboard. We didn't have email addresses. I graduated in 96 with my bachelor's degrees. So I didn't have any notes on the website. I provide all my students with all the notes that I'm going to cover in class. Because why not? <laughs> at the very least, they should read all of those before they come to class because when you get to class that should not be the first time you've been exposed to the information. At a minimum it ought to be the second time you've been exposed to the information and you'll see why that's important shortly. You're going to be sorting through a lot of BS to find what's critically important in your book. Turns out you know as well as I do that book is full of it sometimes, right? Full of fluff. They make it really big and thick and full of color photos and all kinds of neat stuff they call pedagogy so they can justify charging you how much for a new one these days? 200? Anybody, anybody pay more than 200 for a new book at any point? 150? Pretty normal? I know a guy who works in the book industry said 10 years ago he wouldn't believe it if you told him then that books would be over $100 a piece. 
How are they going to justify charging you that much money? Because they fill it with fluff. It's purdy. It's big. But it turns out that's not what all you need to know generally. If you boiled it down to what you need to know, that'd be a much thinner book. It'd be harder to justify charging that much. And then they're going to pay you how much when you sell it back? Like 10% of the cover price. And then they're going to sell it for 75% of its original price. It's a business. They're making money. Smart people making money. I won't begrudge them that, but I will say this. Your job is not so much to worry about the price of books, but to extract from the book, the book all the information that you need to do well in the class. That's your job. So how do you know what is important in that big book? Preview it. Look at the chapter headings. Look at the subheadings. Look at the bolded text, the italicized text, chapter review. You usually got a list of key terms at the end of it when you should know it cold. After you read the chapter and go to class and get in more information, study it. By the time you take the test, you ought to be able to open up back chapter and tell anybody what all that stuff means. That's how well you need to know the material to ensure that you're going to do well on the test. If you can't, there's a hole in your study skills somewhere. You got to know the information, but you also got to be able to pick out what's important. So in our line of work in psychology, oftentimes they got in personality books these giant full color pictures of Madonna and on stage gear looking all wicked and cool. And then they got her like carrying shopping bags with her kids. Like which one's the real Madonna? This one or that one? And they're really just talking about trait theory and whether or not people can have multiple uh, identities in the sense that they can project one here and project one there, but yet be somebody else in a core sense of self. I don't need to know all about Madonna. I certainly don't need big color pictures of her. I need to know about trait theory. I need to get down to the nuts and bolts of what we're talking about in this chapter. And so that's what you're looking for. Boil it down to what's important. Extract it and forget the rest. That's a skill. You have to learn that skill. How to read paragraph by paragraph. Most people go, oh, I got a chapter to read. I got to read this chapter. I surely did back in the day. Might be 25 pages. And you read it. How many people in here have had the experience of reading five, six pages and realizing you don't have a clue what you just read? <laughs> wow. That would be damn near everybody. <laughs> because you're human beings. You have a limited attention span, even though you're diligently attempting to read it and your eyes are actually crossing the page, you're not retaining it. It's just going out as fast as you put it in. We'll see why that is shortly. So don't try to read 25 pages. Break it down into paragraph units. I'm going to read the next 10 paragraphs. If you highlight things, I would do it later. We'll talk about highlighting. But you take a highlighter, you ever buy one of them used books that looks yellow or orange? Because somebody went, yeah, 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 yeah. No, not that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Do you think they were really processing deeply this information? No. That's a speed reading technique. You can take your finger and just do this. And your eyes will track faster than you can verbally say it in your mind. When we read, we tend to do it with verbal language. So if I was reading this, I would say, how to read, do it paragraph by paragraph. Take notes on things that are obviously important. Do not highlight. That's a good speed reading technique, but you don't need a book full of uncritically highlighted material. That took quite a while. If I was looking at the same paragraph, I could go, I get it. Your eyes can take it in faster than you can read it in your mind. Evelyn Wood came up with that technique a long time ago. It's great for getting information on the surface. If you hadn't read the memo before the meeting and you need to meet, you got like five minutes, do that. <laughs> but it, you'll know more than you would have if you didn't. But if you need to know it and remember it and recall it later, you're going to have to process it much deeper than that. So your goal is to critically sort out unneeded material from important material. And you got to figure it's a skill to do this. So you're going to read a paragraph and you go, hmm, is there anything in there? People have been contemplating for eons upon eons what personality really is. Inquisitive minds want to know. You know how they open up a chapter, right? Blah, 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 blah. Anything in that paragraph? Nope. Don't need it anymore. Next paragraph. 
Something about trait, oh, trait theory is bolded or italicized. That's keying me into the fact that I better know what that means. That's an important concept. They're highlighting it to me as an author or as a publisher. And so what I want to do is actually make a bullet on a spiral notebook. You want a spiral notebook for every book you're going to read. That's an important tool for your studying. In fact, you're going to wind up with two spiral notebooks per class. And so what you wind up doing is you take your 25 page chapter, let's say for ease of computation, that it's got 10 paragraphs per page. Let's say you sort through those 250 paragraphs and find 125 of them got something that you ought to know in them. And then you take them out and you bullet it in your own words. Trait theory means this. And then you go down and you see another biological theory means this and so on and so forth. You have now taken a 25 page chapter and condensed it into 150 bullet points, which might cover five spiral notebook pages. But it is the essence of what you need to know. And it may have taken you more time. In fact, it will take you more time to process it like this on the front end. But what you wind up with is a very succinct version of the chapter that you can expose yourself to repeatedly. Taking time to write what's important from each paragraph in the spiral notebook, you get this condensed version that's so quick and easy to read, it might take me, let's say, three hours on the front end to create this little outline of the chapter, but it's a detailed outline of the chapter. Now I got five pages that represents the chapter and I can read it four times in an hour. Now let's say I spend another three hours reading it. I've just read the chapter 12 times in addition to the three hours I did. Now I read that chapter 13 times in six hours. How am I going to do on that test? Pretty good. Repetition works. Repetition works. But you ain't got time to read it three hours. And some people go, why spiral notebook? Can I not use uh, note cards? Of course you can. I don't recommend it. And the reason I don't recommend it is for me to write 125 bullet points means I have to actually sort through 125 cards. Literally. Handling. And what happens when you drop them? You're screwed. They're all out of order. You got to sort them all through. You drop that spiral notebook. What order is it in when you pick it back up? Same order it was when you dropped it in. It's just convenient. Now I flip five pages. If somebody did go through and critically highlight the material they wanted out of that chapter and they did a really good job of it, they would still have to flip through 25 pages to reread it. You're looking to condense your time, maximize your efficiency so you're spending time only on that which you need to spend time on and not spending time on anything extraneous. Paragraph by paragraph reading with note taking takes a lot of time up front, but you don't wind up drifting off. You never have the experience of going through five, six, seven, eight pages and not remembering what you read because you now have a detailed record of everything you read. That's important because you're going to have to do it over and over again. So give yourself a short break after a preset number of paragraphs. Know that your attention span on average as people is about 15 minutes. Some of you have already started to drift off. That's normal. That's absolutely normal. You start thinking about stuff like, I'm hungry. I'm tired. I wonder what he's doing later. Wonder what she's doing later. You start thinking about other stuff despite your best intentions to pay attention. Your attention has limits to it. You have to develop tools to train your attention. So you say 10 paragraphs, I'm going to take a break. You go through, sort it, bullet it. After 10 paragraphs, you take a short break. And by that, I mean you stand up, you stretch, oh, yawn, mm -hmm. maybe walk around a second and then get right back on it. Doesn't mean get up and start checking the email and checking the Facebook, because guess what happens? That's a lot more fun. You're going to wander off. There you were with all the best intentions, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, really? For real? Cool. Oh, yeah, I'll get to that later. And later never comes. Right? Use that time there diligently. Get up, shake it off, because you want to actually physically refocus your attention and hit the next 10 paragraphs. And stay at it the whole predetermined amount of time you said you would sit and study. That's important. You get my notes if you're in my class, but I always challenge people, don't bring them to class with you. Don't bring my notes to class with you. Read my notes before you come to class. Print them off and keep them, but come with a spiral notebook devoted to my class. 
right the whole time that I'm speaking on anything that's relevant for what could be on your test. Not because everything I say is all that important, but because that helps you keep your attention on the speaker. If you bring the instructor's notes with you, you tend to just kind of follow along, passively receiving a lot of verbal information. Occasionally you might star something or make a note in the margin, but you're not really processing the information. You're passively letting it go in one side and it comes right back out the other side unless you make a record. As they say, the faintest ink is better than the best memory. So you want to write down what they're saying. You want to engage that in an effortful task. Dedicate that spiral notebook to each class. Always bring a couple pens and pencils because you know they're going to break. Take notes as close to verbatim, which just means word for word, as possible. Make a shorthand to do it easier. So you can make up any shorthand you want. It doesn't matter what shorthand you use. As long as you understand it, as long as you can read it. And I was in school for the longest time before I realized that this thing right here equaled psychology. The old psi symbol. Psi. I've been writing out psych this and psych that and all I had to do was go shoop boop. That's psychology. They said Freud so many times I can't even tell you how many times. So I, Freud, he was F. Big F. Behavior, B-E-H. Make a shorthand. It don't have to be complicated. It's just got to make it easier for you to write everything that you hear coming out. Let's see if I can make this thing go away. Mm-hmm. Oh, look at me. Word for word is hard to do. And you're like, well, if I'm writing everything somebody says, aren't I going to get off track? Yes. But by trying to stay on track, you are effortfully engaging the speaker. You are trying to hear what they're saying. You're working with the information. You're creating a record that's going to be more or less accurate for your use later. And we'll see how you can make better use of that in a minute. Sit near the front of the class, if not on the front row. It makes it easier to hear. It makes it easier to see. And it makes it easier to train your attention because we all drift off from time to time. You sit in the back and you're tired and it's warm and you've eaten. <laughs> it's easy to go out, right? It's easier to fall out than it is up here, right? There's a little bit of a social pressure, although I had a friend student who fell asleep right there today. <laughs> but I love him and I know he's up all night doing other things that are productive things, good things. But it's harder to fall asleep up front. It's harder to drift off up front. When you sit in the back, you've got to see a sea of people between you and that which you're trying to pay attention to. You've got people crumpling papers. You've got people with laptops. You've got people with uh, cell phones. You've got people coughing. You've got people talking. You've got hotties over here that you're trying to check out. <laughs> Y'all know you do, right? You're sitting in the back going, oh, man. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and girls do that. They're far smoother than boys about it, but they do it too. Boys is like. <laughs> Girls are like. I got you. It's up here. Distractions, 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 distractions. You can check them out after the class is over. Sit up here. Don't put a sea of distraction between you and what you're trying to hear. Get up front. Have your notes ready to go. Be taking them. Attention varies for everybody, and you have to make yourself pay attention. You have to learn to do it. And if you're not taking notes, and I'm not saying take notes about when they go off on a tangent about their family or the Super Bowl or anything like that. If it's relevant to class, you should be taking notes constantly. And you'll know that you're not paying attention if you're not writing. And my hand used to ache after some classes. Floyd Domer taught a class at Appalachian State University on psychopharmacology, but he was actually a research pharmacologist way out of my depth. I didn't have the bio background to understand all of what he was saying, but I loved to listen to him. The man talked with a passion. He didn't have a PowerPoint. He didn't have an outline. He just went, and it was organized, and it was beautiful. And I filled up three spiral notebooks of information with what came out of that man's mouth in lecture time in one semester. And then I went home to read psychopharmacology at 11 or 12 at night and fell asleep within 10 minutes. It was so boring. Listening to him, exciting. Reading about it, not the proper background, boring, difficult, and I would fall asleep. So I had to figure out a trick. I had to make myself pay attention. 
So what I did, kitchen counter, took the book, set it up, read it standing up. Can't fall asleep standing up. And if you do, you need to be asleep. <laughs> That's what you need to do. <laughs> then, then wake up and stand up and read. That's what you got to do. You got to figure that your attention is going to wax and wane. If you don't do something to train it, expect it to be gone quickly. You got to work on your own strategies to stay engaged with material. After you get out of the class and you've got your class notes, review that material within 12 hours. Just read it one time at least. Read the notes that you took in class within a half a day. Because forgetting, as we'll see, is extensive and it happens quickly, very quickly. Then, when you're doing your studying, read the notes from the previous class that you took. Every time. Then read the ones that you've been given. Now, you've got book notes in a spiral notebook. You've got lecture notes in a spiral notebook. You've already got a condensed version. Now highlight that because you'll find out that you can get faster and faster and faster at reading this highlighted material once you've read it five times. Now you really only need to he see certain keywords to refresh your memory about what it is. Now, even as a professional psychologist, I still have to take tests. I still have to get continuing education. To get licensed, I had to take an oral examination with three people I never met before on all the laws of Tennessee that pertain to the practice of psychology, the APA ethics, and a whole bunch of other stuff. A bunch of stuff that amounted to a pile like that. And so I took my time the first time and I condensed it down to, I guess, around 20 or so spiral notebook pages. And then I went through and highlighted the critical information there and I read it over and I read it over and then I read it into an MP3 recorder. And on my drive to Chattanooga, which is four hours, I listened to myself read it back to me. And when I went into that oral examination, they said, we're going to ask you random questions from a list that nobody's ever seen. Are you ready? I said, yes. Let us proceed. I don't remember the particular question the guy asked me at this one. It was the second or third question into it. He asked me a question and I nailed it to the wall. Textbook response. And he looked up at me and he's like, did you anticipate that we were going to ask you that question? Now, I didn't say this, but I'm thinking, what, are you calling me a cheater? You just told me that you're going to ask me questions from a list nobody's ever seen. You're going to pull them randomly. How could I possibly have anticipated that you were going to ask me that question? I knew the material that well. And then when I drove away, don't need to remember it anymore. It was there when I needed it. I performed as I needed to. And then I went on about my business and my life. You want to get it down to a condensed version because as it turns out, you think that you remember stuff by just showing up. Everybody does. And people go, man, there must be something wrong with my memory. Nope. Memory sucks for everybody. Humans don't remember things well. They think they remember things well collectively, but individually we go, well, why can't I remember things well? You can't because none of us can. That's why eyewitness testimony on which most of our judicial system is based is notoriously what? Good or bad? Unreliable. Bad. Because people believe they can remember things accurately and they really do try. They're not lying. They reconstruct their memories incorrectly and then relay it with great confidence, which convinces juries to use it as the truth with a capital T, when at best it's a truth with a little T, with a little fuzziness here and a little fuzziness there, which is easy to lead by simply rephrasing the questions a different way. That's the job of a good lawyer. Get the responses you want from honest people who swore to tell the truth, and they are, to the best of their ability. But the problem is, memory's not that good with human beings. Herman Ebbinghaus, studied it himself. He made up these nonsense syllables. He realized if he tried to study memory on himself, he's already at a limitation because using yourself as your subject is usually not a good idea as a scientist. So he had to be disciplined and rigorous. And he realized some words, if you use regular words, would stick out in his memory better than other words just from previous associations or experiences with them. So he made up nonsense syllables, a bunch of short syllables that had no meaning whatsoever. And he made different lists of them. And then he would vary the amount of time he would study the list and the amount of time between studying the list and recalling the list. And then he would see how well he did on recalling the items from a list. So he would have a pretty objective idea of how good memory is. 
Well, let's say his list was, I don't know, 15 items long, and he studies for five minutes. Study, 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 study. The interval is now going to be 10 seconds. One, two, three. Write them down. As long as you jumped right on it, he did pretty good. If he waited as little as 20 minutes, over 40% of it was gone. Gone. If he waited as little as an hour, over 50% of it is gone. You wait nine hours, now over 60% of it's gone. And what you see is it just kind of levels off so that whatever you remember two days later, you tend to remember about a month later. But it ain't much. I used to be the TA for a grad, uh, or as a graduate assistant, I was a teaching assistant for uh, Scott Geller's class at Virginia Tech, and there was 1,200 people in intro psych, and I would have people come up after the test and very, very earnestly go, I don't know what happened. I should have done better on that test, and I would very sincerely ask them, okay, well, what did you do? Did you read the material? And they're like, yeah, I read the chapter. I was like, when did you do it? Last night. I read the whole thing. I'm like, is that the only time you read it? And they're like, yeah, but I read the whole thing. Boom. One time is gone. Now you don't remember, you don't lose that much information because those aren't nonsense syllables. You've got some experience with chemistry or English or psychology or the English language or whatever language is being taught in. That's why you don't lose that much. But they were making 60s and 70s when they thought reading the material one time should have produced them an A. And it won't. You got to hit it again and again and again and again. Repetition works. All the fancy memory seminars, all the fancy mnemonic devices, that they'll charge you plenty of money to teach you this stuff. But if you think about it, every mnemonic device simply makes you work with the material more than you would have. To construct a mnemonic device, you have to think about the material. You have to contemplate creatively ways to remember it. The more you do that, guess what? The more likely you are to remember it. So if I said ocean is the big five personality traits, ocean, ocean, how am I going to remember that? Oh, openness, C, conscientiousness, E, extroversion, A, what is that? Oh, yeah, agreeableness, and um, N, neuroticism. That's just a mnemonic, but for me to even remember what that is, I have to do what? Say it over and over again until I teach myself the mnemonic. It's not magic. It don't cost a thousand bucks. It's all about working with the information over and over again, but doing so in a way that makes sense in terms of your time. Y'all are all busy people. I know that you are. Life is busy. But notice the university, and this is all of them, expects you to spend three hours outside of class for every hour you spend in class. Which means if you take a 12 semester hours, that theoretically each week you are supposed to be spending 48 hours on school for four classes. That's why they call it full-time school. That's why they treat it with certain status when you're looking at financial aid and benefits. Full-time school equals full-time job. In fact, 48 hours is eight hours more than a full-time job. That's a six-day work week. Nobody does this. And there's no reason to think that they would. But if they did, just... If they did, if you spent 48 hours a week, and that's not breaks, that's not hanging out, that's not sleeping and talking, it's 48 hours on the work. If you did spend that, and that includes class time, what kind of grades would you make in those four classes? I hope you make straight A's, right? But you can't do that. That's not realistic. So the goal is to figure out what between zero and 48 do I need to do to get the job done, and it ain't zero either. It's certainly not 48, but it ain't zero. You got to figure it out. Where is my window of absolute necessity to know that I've studied as much as I really need to study to accomplish my goals? You got to dedicate sufficient time to really study and make sure you're able to focus on it. This is where we get into a difference between technique and motivation. I give people techniques all day long. But if they don't really know why they're in school and they don't really have it in their heart, they don't really have a fire for it, they're just there because they know they're supposed to be there or somebody told them to go there or it seems like the thing that they ought to do, they don't have the motivation, no amount of techniques is going to help. But if you've got the motivation, the techniques help. They will work for you if you will work for them. So hypothetically, if class was four hours a day, and it ain't, 
Ain't nobody going to class four hours a day, 20 hours a week, right? We said 12 semester hours. That means you're probably going four hours a day on maybe three days a week on average, roughly, for those four classes. But many people take what? Five classes, six classes, more than that. They take overloads. They increase their workload. If you got four hours of class a day, why not add an extra hour or two a day? It's a job. Look at it like a job. Now you just make it into a six hour day instead of a four hour day. It's not that much more, but it produces some major benefits. And why not weekends too? So what if it's Saturday? You can sleep till one, get up, hang out till two, study from two to four, and you got the whole night ahead of you. Do that on Sunday too, unless you have a religious prohibition against it. In which case, study a lot on Saturday. So if you got four classes and you study the subject every day, even if it's only 15 minutes per day per subject, that's an extra seven hours a week of studying that you might not be used to having. Believe me, that'll help over zero. Find a place, and it may not be your place, that you can study as free from distraction and use it consistently. You know how it is, I'm sure, in a dorm or as a roommate, when people got other stuff going on, some people are like, hey, I, I, I like noise. I like music in the background. I like being at a coffee house to study. I wouldn't recommend it. And the reason I wouldn't is for most people, they don't realize that they're dividing their attention. They like the music or they like the TV show and they figure they can focus pretty good. But what they're doing is dividing their attention. For that music to go in, especially if it has words associated with it, their auditory cortex is processing that set of words. It's hearing it and it's processing it while you're visually trying to take in information that you're trying to focus on. For me, if you're going to listen to music, make it lyricless music. So there's just sounds but no words that your brain will process even though you're unconscious of it. And if you got people arguing and you got people yakking and you got people curling up the music, find another place. My place was in my house but it was after my kids went to bed. But during the day it was at the library. In between classes I was at the library like a monk in a cell. Go there, do your thing because it's your job. When a test is coming up, increase the amount you study daily. And the day, night, or morning before the test, study more, way more. Five hours wouldn't be unreasonable. Ten wouldn't be unreasonable. Studying a bunch at one time is called cramming. And some people go, cramming is bad. That's not correct. <laughs> cramming is good, unless it's the only studying you do, in which case it is then bad, but it's still better than nothing. <laughs> And it's bad for the reasons I've already said, because it's not going to be sufficient to really understand the information. You need to really understand the information. But if you've been studying every day and then you cram for three or four hours, you're not learning it for the first time. You're reviewing it for what? The tenth time? You're solidifying what you know. That's what you're after. How are you going to do all this in this busy day you got? You got maybe... You got social obligations. Some of you got organizations you're members of. Some of you got student jobs. Some of you got jobs in the community. Some of you got children or families. So you got more than just school as a job. And it's important. All of those things are important things. So you need to devote time to that. You need to devote time to your social life, to your recreation, right? As well as your work and your school. That's important. So you got to organize your time. I used to carry around in my pocket it wasn't until grad school that I got turned on to this, a little paper calendar in which I would write everything. When papers were due, when tests were coming up, right? When meetings were going to happen, when work shifts were going to occur, things like that. When, when holidays were going to be in for school. Now I can do it electronically and that's nice, so get a calendar. If it's electronic, great. Make sure you've got a backup if it crashes. Always read your syllabus for each class and note when all the tests are. Note when all the projects are scheduled to be due. Put that in your calendar. Make little sticky notes and stick it on your fridge. But if you know anything about psychology, you want to habituate to that. And all you want to see is fridge. Then you won't see that note. So move that note around. Every week or so, move that to your bathroom mirror. Then to your dresser. Move it around so it stays on your mind. The syllabus is your contract with your instructor. It's more than just knowing what stuff's due. It's also a contract between you and the instructor. It's what they expect you to do that semester. They aren't really supposed to change it substantially without some discussion with the group and certainly notification. And if you ever have a grade suffer as a result of that action, 
That's your documentation of what you were supposed to be expected to do. You can appeal a grade. If you think it was an unfair grade, appeal it. Go through the proper channels, take your documentation, make your case. Don't just take it lying down. If you got a bad grade because you didn't work hard enough or you didn't pay attention to the syllabus, that's different. But if you read your syllabus and you wrote down what was expected, you're going to know what it told you to do and you're going to know when people deviate from it. Make every class your top priority. There's no reason to miss a class unless you are deathly ill or some emergency arose. And drinking too much last night is not an emergency. Drink some water, drink some aspirin with it and go to class. Don't drive drunk to class. <laughs> Don't get high on campus. They will arrest you and then you can't go to school no more. But it turns out that people have a misunderstanding about the way substances work and a lot of people abuse substances while they're going to school and work jobs. As it turns out, so far as I understand it, the last three presidents we had smoked marijuana. Turns out most surveys show over half the people who are of adult age at some point in their life try it. I don't care if you do or you don't. I stopped using it so I can talk all about it. <laughs> That's one of the nice benefits of not using. You don't have to worry about people pee testing you. I smoked pot every day when I was an undergrad. Every day. All day. I drank like a fish. I was a straight up alcoholic. <laughs> I kid you not. I don't care. I don't mind to tell the truth because I hope it connects with somebody. At the end of my drinking phase, which was about 17, 18 years ago, I was just drinking three quarts of malt liquor a night. I thought that was a very reasonable amount. And I went to class every day and I made A's. I made A's. Nobody ever wanted me not to work for them, ever. Even when I was a rowdy pre-college person working, jumping from one job to the other in construction. When I showed up, I did my job. I might have smelled funny, but nobody cared. They knew when I showed up, I was like, going to do my job. I'm going to do it well, and then I'm going to go home and get high. That's what's going to happen. That's the way it goes back in those days. I've changed my ways for my own reason. I'm not moralizing, but I was uh, privy to a, a, a picking up of a person who had imbibed too much and, and good for him for getting a designated driver, never drive under the influence. And he was being asked on the way home, you going to class tomorrow? And he goes, man, I don't know. It's like classes at one. And I was like, what? Seriously, dude, it's 1230 at night. You can drink for seven more hours, go to sleep at 7.30, wake up at 12.30, drink some water and take some aspirin and go to class. What's wrong with you? Class is at one o'clock. Lightweight, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Class is number one. Party is number two at best. Responsible use if you're gonna use is number one. Figuring out whether you belong in school at the time is really what that's about. Because if you ain't in class, you ain't really motivated to be in school. And you've got to do a gut check and see whether now's the time and this is the place. People leave and they come back. My daughter left and then she went back. She dropped out. She didn't use substances at all because I'm proud of her for that. But she wasn't really feeling the school thing inside. She was just going because she'd been told all her life she ought to. Second semester, she withdrew from all her classes, which made me proud because I knew she finally listened to me. I said, if you ever leave, take W's, don't take F's. She withdrew officially. She went out into the world. She got married. She got a job. She paid bills. She hated that. And then she went back to school and made number days and B's. And she's still figuring out a career path, but now she's thinking about going to a master's of library science program, and she can do that because she took the right path and did the right thing. That's what this is about. Make this number one. This is at least number two. Family number one, school number two. The job that supports you going to school, number three. Because <laughs> this is gonna get you the job you love down the road, right? Prioritize. Make sure you carve out time daily to study and carve out way more time and days just prior to tests. Pre-test. I'm talking like 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes before the test. Get to the test as soon as you can get to the test. 
And by the way, psychology students, if you need speaker series credit, see me after we finish. I forgot about announcing that. My apologies. In this building, I would have been out that door there, or I would have been out that door right there, or I'd have been holed up in one of these little nooks in the lobby with my spiral notebooks. I'd get there as early as I can. I'd find a place where nobody was. It was real close to where I needed to take the test. And I'm just going to sit there like this and read and read and read and read and read and prime and reprime and reprime. And then I'm walking in and I'm ready to go. I got my pencil, I got my pen, whatever it is. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to sit right on down. And I'm going to avoid talking to these people. You know how they do before a test. Yeah, blah, 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 yeah, blah, blah, blah. What's that? Is that it? No, that ain't it. I don't know what it is. These are not people you want to talk to before a test. You could ask me any day what this was about, and I would have told you to the best of my ability as a student what I understood it to be. At the moment of the test, I literally sometimes would have to put my elbows on the desk. You know how you act like you got your hands supporting your head, but you really got your ears closed? That's what I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to hear it. It's time to take tests. Bam. Other thing is, don't ever give your spiral notebook to nobody. Your spiral notebook is gold. That's your notes. That's everything you worked so hard to get into a beautiful, condensed fashion. That's your thing. I made a mistake in undergrad of loaning my spiral notebook to this girl. She seemed very nice. She had been at class all the time. She's like, I got to miss class. Uh, uh, so I was wondering if I, I could take your, your notes. I'll be back on Monday. Test is on Wednesday. Swear I'll be back. And I'm like, well, all right, go ahead. Didn't come back on Monday. Blew me away. Last time I ever loaned anything to anybody like that. After classes, after that, people are like, can I get a look at your notes? I'm like, you are welcome to make a copy of my notes. We can walk to the library, you supply the quarters for the Xerox machine, and you can Xerox my notes to your heart's content. But don't expect me to explain my shorthand to you. You got to figure that out. So you keep that stuff. It's yours. Now you're ready to perform. Now. Get comfortable. Breathe deep. If you got test anxiety, usually people with test anxiety have studied a plenty. They know what they need to know, but they get into a situation where they're going to be evaluated and their heart rate rises. They start to get an adrenaline response. I have a whole nother video that Dr. Curry and team have created that's out there on YouTube now. And ETSU iTunes, is that it? ETSU and YouTube. ETSU and YouTube. Watch that. It's an hour long. It will tell you how to stop a panic attack. If you can stop a panic attack, you can conquer test anxiety. There's a very specific procedure you need to follow. It's right out there on YouTube. Go get it. Learn it. Practice it. If you do it right, you do it long enough, and you do it persistently and consistently, you'll beat it. But basically, you know what you need to know. So take a deep breath in. Take a deep breath out. <sighs> Completely. Relax until your heart rate settles. Then look at item number one. Don't pay attention to other people while you're in that test. At the very least, you don't want to be accused falsely of cheating. So I don't want to be looking at anybody else, number one. But they're just going to distract you. You don't want distractions. You want focus in your test. You want to get calm. And then immediately, if you've got scratch paper, write down anything. Data dump right there. Quadratic equation. Anybody know it? Go ahead, say. X equals negative B plus minus squared. Square 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 yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? Why would you try to keep that in your head and then do problems with it? Just dump it. Write it on a piece of paper. Say it again, 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 again. Walk in there, get your piece of paper, write it out. Now all you got to do is plug in numbers. You don't have to remember the formula while you're looking at problems. If you go into my psych test, you go, oh, ocean, O-C-E-A-N. Now you're done with that. As soon as you see a problem that asks about trait theory, big five, you're looking for the answer that has O-C-E-A-N. And you don't have to think about it anymore. You dump it. When you got multiple choice tests, cover up the answer choices. Read the stem carefully and answer it in your mind. You know this material well enough, you should know the answer. Once you feel confident with the answer, now you look, A, is that it? Nah, mark it out. Write on it if you can. B, kind of, sort of, that's kind of what I'm thinking, question mark. C, huh, definitely not, mark out. D, 
B or D. Now you've got it down to two. That's better than 25% chance to knock it down to a 50% chance is a good thing. Four options to two options. But you know what? If you know it well, go, why would it be B? Why would it be D? And you'll probably figure it out. If you don't know it, star it. Make sure you skip the bubble on the answer sheet and keep on moving because you know from your own experience, sometimes you'll go to test questions later that will tell you the answer to a previous question, right? You're like, oh, if this is here, then this must be that there. So don't agonize over it. That's a strategy. I worked with a woman once at Appalachia State. She's like, I know this material. And when I asked her the questions, she could tell me the answers. But I don't give oral exams. I give written exams. She needed to be able to translate that to written. I told her that. Just cover them up. Think about it. Mark them out. She went from making 60s to almost 100s every time. Just by changing the strategy. If you got an essay test, you got an hour, for example, to do four questions. Let's say one of them is... Uh, Compare and contrast the reasons for the Industrial Revolution in uh, Europe versus America. Right? So there's similarities, there's differences. First thing you want to do is not find the hardest question and try to answer it. First thing you want to do is go, I got four questions. Let me data dump everything I know on each question. So you just start bulleting stuff out on scrap paper. Take two minutes per question. Now you've got 13 minutes per question to go back and answer it, but you've got an outline to follow. And that outline will prompt more things in your mind so it'll be much more organized response and you're much more likely to recall all the things you actually learned about it. And then you gotta manage your time because if you spend, oh, an extra 15 minutes, I was supposed to spend 13, that means I got two minutes less. Adjust the time across the test and work it methodically and systematically. Now, we're almost there, hang with me. If you got a cumulative final, it's not that big a deal. It's a big deal to people because people don't know how to do what I'm telling you to do. If you do what I'm telling you to do, it ain't a big deal to have a cumulative final. It really isn't. Study the previous exams and material for each new test. Review it each week. Your course, your focus is going to be on the current test. So if I study for test one, I do well, good. Now test two, my focus is on test two, but I'm going to go back and reread all my test one stuff. When I do test three, I'm going to really focus on test three, but I'm going to go back and reread test one and test two. When I do test four, focus is there, reread one, two, and three. When I get to test five, I'm not relearning stuff. People freak out because most people do test one and go, whew, done. And they don't look at it again. Then they do test two and don't look at it. They do test three and they don't look at it. They do test four and don't look at it. They get to the final cumulative and they're like, oh my goodness, I don't remember anything. And they have to reteach themselves stuff they learned three months ago. If they were revisiting it all along the way, they wouldn't be reteaching themselves. They'd be reinforcing what they already know. That's how you get a cumulative final done without anxiety. If you don't have a cumulative final exam, you know what you do with that information after you're done with a test? Forget it. You don't need it anymore. I took 160 credit hours almost in getting my degrees at an undergrad level. How much of that do you think I really remember of the millions of words I probably read and heard? I can't remember all that. I don't need to though. I didn't need to remember everything from my oral exam from my professional licensure, not because I'm a, a poor practitioner, but because I'm a good practitioner. I know what I need to know to do the job. And if I ever need to know something about Tennessee law, guess what? I know where to look it up. I know to look it up. I know how to find information. I know how to evaluate that information. I can get it quickly and use it. So if you don't need it immediately thereafter, dump it. People who have doctorate degrees, it isn't like they're so much brighter than everybody else. After 11 years of studying psychology, I better know more than the average person. Or there's something wrong with me. But it wouldn't surprise me if most people don't remember one class in psychology. I took class after class after class after class after class. That's why specialists and experts our go-to people because they re-expose themselves to the material time and time again and stay updated on the current stuff. College teaches you to find information quickly and comprehend, evaluate it critically, figure out what's important, what's reliable, and what is not. And that's a value add to your future employer. Your bachelor's degree is going to be hard earned, but when you're done with it, they're just going to hand you a piece of paper for all that work. And they're actually not going to do it when you walk the stage. You're going to have to come back and get it. That's an important piece of paper because it allows you to apply for jobs that you otherwise do not qualify to apply for. But when you get that job, 
Your employer's not going to go, oh, you got a bachelor degree? Come tell us what you learned in college. They're going to say what? Here's the policy and procedure manual. Read it, know it, do it. But if you understand how to use information, how to understand problems, you're going to be a value add to that employer. You might be the employer. You might be the entrepreneur. And you're going to be able to analyze problems. You're going to be able to go to literature. You're going to be able to see what's been done before, what works, do, what doesn't work. Design an intervention or a solution. Implement it. Measure it. Determine whether or not it did any good or not or if it made it worse. And by that token, you're going to make your organization better. By that token, you're going to make this world better. And that's why this college experience is so important. It isn't because you get the piece of paper. It's because you become a better thinker. And that helps all of us when our society becomes better at thinking critically. And that's all I got today. Thank you all for coming very much. <laughs>